you all for joining us. Um, if you didn't hear me earlier, if you didn't register online, please share your AIA number for credit for this um, session. And thank you once again for joining us early in the morning. We're really excited to be able to continue our sustainable initiatives related to low carbon design. And we have the pleasure of having Frank join us this morning to focus on how all of us can um, improve our specification and improve our um, their priorities as architects related to sustainable specification and low embodied concrete. Um, so without without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Frank. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Let me see if I can put my share my screen. Um, just a little background on um, myself. Uh, I'm currently president of AIA Rhode Island, and I sit on the uh, CSI Northeast Board, so uh, encompasses everything um, in the Northeast U.S. Uh, my my background was I uh, worked on Wall Street for like 10 years. I worked for Morgan Stanley and AIG doing all their development, and uh, then I went into academia for another 10 years. I was the associate dean of the School of Architecture at New York Institute of Technology, Spent spent most of my career in the New York area. Then after that, I um, went and uh, ran uh, Emre Erlot's office in New York. He's a Turkish architect. He won the Aga Khan Award and a bunch of big awards. And I ran his office. And during that tenure, I was we were doing a lot of uh, like twenty million dollar houses in Miami. <laughs> So this is this is when I started getting into two things specifically controls, building controls because optimization of controls you can save thirty percent of energy if you can do that, and concrete because uh, of the resiliency issues of it and in Miami and so also during this period of time I I started a center for smart building technology in Boston and I started working then the energy then the world started to transition to uh, embodied carbon. And I started focusing my efforts on concrete specifically, because as we know, concrete accounts for about 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, it's it's an area that if we can make inroads in this area, uh, it's such a valuable material. I mean, concrete doesn't have the biggest carbon footprint by any means of all these other materials like glass and, and aluminum, but it's just used so its use is so pervasive. It's the second most used material in the world after water. And um, so um, I think we need to really work on getting that 8% lower. And even if you can reduce that by, uh, you know, 10 to 30%, huge impact on the planet. And so I've been focusing, uh, looking more into the details of that. And I've been working with uh, NRMCA hired me to kind of work on their low carbon kind of efforts. Um, so uh, AI credits, Danielle's gonna handle all the credits. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about today, performance-based specifications um, and um, just the balancing of all these issues we deal with. At NRMCA, they also have a, um, you know, they have about 10 people in Washington, D.C. at their headquarters. They're they're like the industry uh, rep for all the ready mix uh, companies around the U.S. And they have a lot of resources in uh, Washington, and they're really working hard on uh, getting their members to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete. And they have a team there, about 10 members, that will help architecture offices uh, to lower their carbon by reviewing specifications and giving ideas back on uh, kind of how you can edit your specifications to increase the lowering of carbon and uh, even looking at strategies for some of your plans and and uh, details. So um, that's a resource we'll be talking about a little bit later. So, okay, I'm starting to get echo, but there we go. Is concrete sustainable? Um, and what is sustainable concrete? It's kind of difficult to define. There are many factors that can influence the way concrete is manufactured, designed, built, used, recycled, that ultimately affect the environmental footprint of concrete and the structures we build with concrete. 
whether one is designing a high rise building, pavement, bridge, dam, or warehouse, concrete is an important component used as foundation and superstructure. And these structures can have a significant impact on our environment through their life cycle. Architects can influence the performance and environmental impact of structures through effective design and specifications, regardless of the materials being used. You know, I was also uh, in my role as president of AIA Rhode Island. I went to uh, the leadership summit in Washington, D.C. and met with our senators and representatives. I can't remember when that one. It was earlier this year. And uh, we were, you know, AIA was pushing Resilient America Bill. And as we see recently in the news, like uh, the fires in Hawaii and everything, resiliency is a big issue. And uh, I really think if we can get the carbon down on concrete, it could be the um, uh, saving material uh, for the future. The single biggest influence an architect can have on the environment impacts of a structure is through efficient design, the following are several factors that can affect the performance of concrete and concrete structures, energy efficiency, resilience, aesthetics, structural efficiency, cost. Um, one of the big things with concrete is uh, that we work a lot with the MIT uh, Concrete uh, Innovation Lab, and they talk about over-design is a really big issue. Uh, most structures are over-designed and in with concrete, the carbon is really with the cement. I think like 70, 80% of the carbon is with the cement because of the high temperatures it takes to make the clinker. Uh, and the, uh, not only the high temperatures required from, uh, you know, getting the heat and the fuel required, but also the off-gassing. So anything um, we can do to reduce the uh, carbon footprint of cement, and, and we'll be talking about several ways to do that with uh, SCMs and admixtures and stuff like that. Really important. You know, there are several different case studies all around the country. This is one in Rowan, San Francisco. Uh, the zigzagging concrete echoskeleton stands out from other building and negates the need for interior columns, maximizes the interior space, interior space for residents. Uh, this is one of one project that used high volumes of slag cement and fly ash to reduce an environmental footprint. So slag cement and fly ash are SCMs, supplementary uh, uh, concrete uh, materials that are added to kind of reduce the cement. Slag is from the steel industry, a waste product, and fly ash is from the coal burning industry. Uh, so these those two materials have been used in concrete since the 70s. And um, there are many examples uh, recently with, like, for instance, in Boston, we just were celebrating this building, the Boston University Computer Science Building. It's kind of like the Jenga Tower building, really one of the most, uh, one of the greenest buildings in Boston. And they used uh, fly ash. But, you know, the problem in Boston is, there isn't a fly ash is a waste product from the coal burning industry. So there isn't a lot of that around in New England these days. So they have to actually ship it from Ohio. But um, these these sort of uh, things are usually laying in a landfill and it's using these things significantly, significantly decreased, like between 10 and 30 percent, the carbon, uh, the carbon footprint of concrete so people have been using these for years and with little to no cost addition you can reduce the carbon footprint by like 10 to 30 percent there are many reports on this if you can you can even look them up at the rocky mount rocky mountain institute we did a report in 21 or 22 about this and So concrete mixtures, the proportion of ingredients used for concrete mixtures can have a significant influence on the environmental footprint of concrete, but this determination should not be limited to the mixture composition. The impacts to constructability and performance of the structure must also be considered. For example, the mix design shown in this table has 50% SCMs, which would generally be considered to ha have a reduced carbon footprint. Is this mixture sustainable? It, it is still difficult to tell. It depends on um, 
your definition of sustainability. We'll talk a little bit about that. So what if you need early high strength uh, concrete to be able to turn the forms around in a high rise building, or you need to post tension a slab on the second or third day, or you need to lift tilt up panels in a timely fashion, a mix with 50% replacement might not meet the owner's or contractor's early strength requirements, which means the mix design would not be sustainable. In general, for a concrete mixer to be sustainable, it must be able to meet the performance requirements of the owner, designers, contractor, and producer, in addition to meeting the following criteria that support sustainable construction. One, minimize energy and CO2 footprint. Two, minimize potable water use. Three, minimize waste. Four, in increase the use of recycled content. This is another case study that uh, older one with the Denver International Airport, uh, complex mixed designs, high strength concrete, self-consolidating concrete, lightweight concrete, complex structural systems, ballrooms, transfer beams, sloping roof deck, architecturally exposed concrete, clean and attractive finish, selected concrete, fire resistance, strength. There are, um, you know, we're getting more and more um, case study examples and NRMCA kind of kind of tracks these and makes case studies out of them. Um, they have a new program of tracking innovation in concrete. And in the past, I think uh, just this year, they started an innovation awards program for sustainable concrete. And in the past, it was kind of hard to keep track of all this stuff because we'd have to go out and, and find it, these examples. But now they're kind of coming coming to us so we can publicize them and make them available. We just did a case study on uh, Biggs, uh, new uh, corporate headquarters in Copenhagen, which is an innovative new building. We're gonna do one on the uh, 270 Park Avenue, Norman Foster building in New York, which has uses um, a lot of innovative glass puzzling for which we'll talk about in a little bit and stuff like that. So there's a lot of interesting new things popping up every single day. It's, it's like a challenge to keep up on all these examples, but we, I think the NRMCA kind of use itself as a broker, kind of uh, collecting all these things and distributing to all its, anybody who's interested. Specifications for concrete construction established project requirements that the contractor and material suppliers must comply with. Project specifications that adhere to industry standards are generally supportive of performance-based criteria and sustainable concrete construction. However, many project specifications incorporate additional unnecessary prescriptive requirements that tend to detect from concrete construction retaining its environmental benefits. So obviously specifications are the, are the point, uh, the inflection point where all this stuff kind of, your intent is made known to the uh, contractor and the, the whole project team. I, you know, I was also at one point in my career, the uh, president of Metro New York CSI, and, uh, you know, I have a CCS certification, and um, specifications are a really important, important issue. Concrete performance. ACI Committee 132 on responsibilities state that the basic premise of contracts between parties is that responsibilities should be provided with assigned responsibilities responsibility that each party has a certain expertise and should be responsible for its own work. Another important issue is that there are several entities on the construction project. In general, there is the design materials and construction. The concrete producer cannot bear responsibility for service life. It takes all entities to deliver the service life expected by the owner. There are models that attempt to do this, but there are several assumptions behind them. So the question becomes, what do we mean by performance requirements for concrete? This is one definition that was arrived by, by other in, industry members participating in the P2P committee. Uh, performance of concrete materials are based on performance indicators measured by the standard test methods with defined acceptance criteria stated in the contract documents and no restrictions on the parameters of concrete mixture proportions. The general concept of how a performance-based specification, specification works, which I'm sure you're all aware of, there would be a qualification and certification system that establishes the standards for concrete production facilities and the people involved. And NRMCA and ACI produce a lot of these certification systems. 
The design professional would define the performance requirements of the concrete for the different members in the structure. Producers and contractors would partner to ensure that the right mixture is designed, delivered, and installed to meet the performance requirement. The submittal would document that the mixture will meet the specification requirements and include pre-qualification tests. After the concrete is placed, a series of field acceptance tests would be conducted to determine if the concrete meet the performance requirement. There would be a clear, a clear set of instructions outlining what happens when concrete does not conform to the, conform to the performance requirement. A prescriptive specification is one that includes clauses for means and methods of concrete ad, ad mixture, concrete mixture proportions and construction techniques rather than the defining end, end product requirements. It violates the basic principle when responsibility is assigned without authority. Many times the intended performance is not clearly indicated in the contract documents and the prescriptive requirements may conflict with the intended performance. Prescriptive specifications limit competitive bidding since all bidders are required to follow a prescription. It provides no challenge to the innovative, innovative producer. The bidder with the lowest investment and quality control has the advantage, and this is not the, in the owner's best interest. So NRMCA went out and did the survey. Results of the survey is uh, last column shows that ACI standards say about prescription. For example, 85% of the specs in which the concrete was not exposed to F3 has still had an SCM quantity restriction. 80% of the specs don't meet either maximum water to cement ratio when not applied or, or when not applicable or minimum CM plus eight over the maximum water to cement ratio. So these are some of the issues, you know, once again, we, uh, NRMCA does a free specification review and they have guide specs to look at this stuff. There's a lot of legacy carryover um, specification stuff that is included in a lot of specifications. And we, you know, a lot of people don't know about this uh, specification review service that we have, which is free. And, but we do a lot of the big firms, you know, one of the, one of the firms recently told me, we don't need you to review our specs. We have our specs reviewed by our engineer, Bureau Happel. And, and uh, my response was, that's good because we review their specs. <laughs> so, so there are a lot of uh, references that, uh, we're kind of like a broker for all these kind of things uh, that are available through uh, ACI and NRMCA and um, and all these things. So an example of prescriptive specification. Uh, this is an example. Let's review some issues with this. Um, this specification establishes requirements for water to cement ratio for all portions of the structure, regardless of whether there is a durability issue to be addressed or not. We will also see that there's no relationship between the strength specified with the water to cement ratio. The specification requires 470 pounds of Portland cement, regardless, unsure what the intent is here. This is a continuation of the same spec. The section now increased the minimum Portland cement ratio to 570 pounds per yard. The table is referenced for water to cement ratio. This table is used to, used to be in PCA design and control and the commentary of ACI 318 several years ago. It was intended as a conservative start for someone who did not have any basis for establishing the mixture proportions as a start. Clearly, the water to cement ratio stated for typical strengths are significantly low and are not consistent with the strength that will be achieved at that water to cement ratio and are not consistent with the cold durability requirements. There is a limitation on the amount of fly ash. The intent of this is not clear. More fly ash may be needed for ASR or sulfate resistance. It has restrictions on water addition and a requirement that slump should be tested before adding admixtures. This is unreasonable require this is an unreasonable requirement and unsure as to how this can be accomplished. This is a continuation of the same spec. This section now increased the minimum Portland cement to 517 pounds per yard. The table is referenced for water to cement ratio. This table is used to be in PCA design.
Consider an example of a prescriptive specification for concrete used for interior building columns. The specification requires a 0.4 water to cement ratio, a minimum cement content of 640 pounds per cubic yard, a maximum fly ash content of 15% by mass of cementitious material, a compressive strength of 4,000 PSI, and a maximum slump of four inches. For this structural element, the critical performance characteristics is the compressive strength. Since the column is protected from exposure for water to cement ratio limit is not necessary for durability and the requirement for a minimum cementitious, cementitious content is not needed to meet the strength requirements. Presumably the limit on fly ash is to ensure rapid strength gain for form stripping, but this is an issue of means and methods of construction and should be therefore and should therefore be avoided in the specification. The restriction on the water to cement ratio and slump will likely cause placement problems with, congest which, with conject congested reinforcement and likely result in surface defects due to difficulties with consolidation. One option is to start with water estimated at 295 pounds per cubic yard for the target slump and with the local materials and you uh, use a cementitious content of 700 and 40 pounds per cubic yard to meet the maximum water to cement requirement. The strength of this mixture is more likely to be in the range of 7,000 PSI or higher. This mixture also has the high paste content, which will cause associated problems, such as high heat of hydration, shrinkage, and creep. The mix will not be the most economical one because of the high cementitious material content. Another option is to start with maximum cementitious materials content and use the maximum water to, to get the water content, water to cementitious material to get the water content. In this case, a water reducer will be required to achieve the slump. The strength of this mix will be similar to the previous option because it is at the same water to cement ratio. The paste volume is lower but it is likely this mixture might have problems with placing and finishing because of a likely higher doses, dosage of admixtures. In a performance-based mixture, the producer can develop optimized mixture approaches to achieve early age strength required by the contractor and the later age strength required by the design. An option would be to use a self-consolidating concrete to facilitate placement this mixture has the lowest pace volume that brings other benefits with it. These are the guide to performing specifications for ready mix uh, concrete that NRMCA produces. Um, the uh, general guidance for performance specifications are do not limit material ingredients that are permitted in standards. Do not try to control means and methods such as early age strength and slump. Do not limit global warming potential or carbon footprint for each mix, but establish a carbon budget for the entire building. This is an important, especially with the, this is an important point, especially with incentives that we see coming down the line. Uh, you know, GSA is, is, has instituted a 20% reduction in all their buildings and the carbon footprint of concrete. Other, there are other incentives that are coming state by state. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but um, you know, uh, like a typical building has many different types of concrete, foundations, columns, slabs, walls, all different PSIs. So once you start saying, it's not good to say each one of those elements should have like, for instance, a 20% reduction in a carbon footprint. It's much more cost effective and it achieves the same goal to say the whole building as a whole will have a 20% reduction in a carbon footprint. This way you have much more uh, latitude in your team has much more latitude in meeting the the required outcome and it'll and it'll, it'll be a lot more cost effective you should take a picture of this and uh you can just download this guide to approving uh specifications it has notes many notes on reducing embodied carbon footprint and like i say we also you send us our specs, you send me your specs and I'll have the team uh, review them and make, and and just, they call it a, an RMCA has a thing called design assistance program. They'll give you, uh, they'll give you your specs back with, you know, hints and tips in the margin. 
To achieve high performance concrete, it's all about the quality of the paste, supplementary, supplementary cementitious materials. Once again, these are things like fly ash, slag, uh, there's glass pozzolans, stuff like that. Admixtures. Admixtures are important because uh, they uh, uh, pump ability and all this different things that are site specific. The quantity of paste, minimize, minimize the cementitious materials, control the water, the aggregate grading, improve quality control. Uh, quality, as I said before, quality control, uh, NRMCA and ACI has tons of quality control issues, things that should be specified in your specifications. Specific durability issues and constructability. So specifications should not restrict achieving these goals. So these are uh, specification sustainability, specification provisions. If you restrict the type and source of cement, the sustainability will go down, performance may go up or down, costs will go up. If you do not permit cements conforming to ASTM C1157 and ASTM C595, sustainability will go down, performance may go either way, cost may go either way. Restrictions on cement alkali content, sustainability will go down, performance can go either way, cost will go up. Restrictions on type and source of aggregates, sustainability will, will go down, performance can go either way, cost will go up. Restrictions on characteristics of aggregates, sustainability down, performance either way, cost up. Minimum content for cementitious materials, sustainability down, performance up either way, costs will go up. Restriction on quality of SCM, sustainability will go down, performance will go down, costs will go up. Restriction on type and characteristics of SCM, sustainability down, performance will go down, costs will go up. Restriction on type and brands of admixtures, sustainability may go either way, performance will go down, costs will go up. Same class of concrete for all members, sustainability will go down, performance could go either way, costs will go up. Requiring higher strength than required for design, sustainability will definitely go down, performance not really affected, costs will go up. Invoking maximum water to cement ratio when not applicable, sustainability down, performance not required, cost to go up. Requiring a high air content, sustainability down, performance down, cost up. Restricting the use of a test record for submittals, sustainability will go down, performance to go down, cost to go up. Restriction on changing proportions when needed to accommodate material variations and ambient conditions. Sustainability will go down, performance down, cost to go up. And the last one of these, requirement to use potable water, sustainability down, performance can go up or down, cost to go up. Not permitting recycled aggregates and materials, sustainability down, performance go up or down, cost to go down. Not requiring accredited testing labs, sustainability will go down, performance is not really affected, cost to go up. Specific limitations on slump, sustainability down, performance down, cost not really affected. So there are different exposure categories when you're specing uh, concrete. Um, this is a this is kind of like a uh, we don't have time to go all these, but they're mostly the associated with the freeze thaws cycle sulfate water and corrosion resistance and the picture on the left is a really good picture from um the portland cement association showing where this would these cements would be the these concretes would be exposed and what their category is so prepared design mixtures for each class of concrete on the basis of laboratory trial mixtures or test date data or both according to ACI 301 design mixtures shall meet the specified strength requirement in the following table this is where the structural engineer can specify its physical characteristics and mechanical properties of the concrete along with the durability criteria without prescribing the mixed design 
NRMCA's guide specification provides alternative performance tests and criteria for ASR shrinkage, shrinkage etc. So these exposure resources for selecting durability exposure classes, there's a matrix that was just uh, introduced, updated this year. Um, you should take a, use your camera to get this document. Uh, it's a spreadsheet with the matrix on all these exposure categories. And like I say, it's just been updated recently. So it's a good thing to have in your toolkit. Plant qualification. At the very minimum, every project should require NRMCA concrete plant and truck certification. There are over 2,300 plants certified, and those that are not will get certified if specified on the project. Some state DLTs have certification programs that are similar to NRMCA's program. And some projects you might want to consider NRMCA's Green Star certification. There are just over 300 plants certified and likely to be able to get certified relatively quickly. And finally, if you're working on a green project, consider NRMCA Sustainable Concrete Plant Certification. This is the newest of the certifications and the most difficult to achieve. So it will only work on a project using an integrative design process where all the parties are involved early on in the project, including concrete suppliers, so they can prepare for certification. You know, the whole move uh, from design bill, bid bill to like this integrative design process is so important because there's so much uh, latent uh, technical knowledge. You know, and, you know, concrete is kind of a local product and uh, getting these people to the table early and getting their their feedback, especially with concrete, is very important. We should and you'll find like in certain regions, I find like uh, the green the people working with the greenest concrete, you know, it's like a pool of people and it's constantly expanding. And one of NRMCA's goals is to really expand that uh, as much as possible. One of the regions, you know, we have um, uh, one of the problems in New England, especially in Boston right now, was that there wasn't enough EPDs, environmental product declarations for concrete. And uh, it was a problem in the ecosystem because um, you need an EPD really if you're comparing your greenhouse gas emission, like a 20% reduction in embodied carbon, such as for GSA products. You have to compare that against the certain benchmarks. And NRMCA also produces the benchmark reports for all the regional areas. So they show all the, all the, um, concrete manufacturer or the ready mix manufacturers in the region and they're they'll give the average EPD data for each one of those for that region so now you have a benchmark from which to uh prove that you're reducing by 20 percent or 10 percent whatever the requirement is so one of the problems that we've been working on uh recently in Massachusetts was there wasn't enough EPDs so we worked with the uh, government agency called the Mass Clean Energy Center. Uh, we worked with them and we started a program, uh, an EPD Kickstarter program. And that program will reimburse uh, uh, concrete, the concrete industry for doing their EPDs. I think EPDs cost between three and $5,000 for something like that. And they'll reproduce a, certain, a major portion of that to get more EPDs into the system. So we suggested a minimum that a qualified producer in a project has an uh, NRMCA certified concrete technologist level two on staff. Most quality producers will meet this requirement. For some critical projects, uh, you might want to consider the NRMCA certified plant managers. For example, the Army Corps of Engineers, which I worked a lot with in my past, uh, requires certified plant managers on their projects. You could also consider certified delivery professionals. New York City requires all producers to have their drivers certified. NRMCA has an online training and certification program, so most drivers can get certified if, the re if required in the specifications. So what about embodied carbon? Do not specify carbon footprint for each mix application. Specify a carbon budget, which we talked about for the, for the concrete on the project. Permit more flexibility to meet other performance requirement and work with your team in the integrated project delivery type manner to get that expertise to the table earlier. 
And finally, for projects trying to meet very high green standards, perhaps lead version four type standards or architecture 2030 or living building challenge, keep in mind EPDs only work when all material and product suppliers on the project are required to submit them, not just concrete. We uh, also have templates and guides for lead version four. So if you're working on a lead version four project, we have some resources to help you with that. Another case study, um, this is uh, through a series of iter iterative meetings with concrete producer Cal Portland, Thelen and KPFF structural engineers identified structural requirements, constructability needs, and, and greenhouse gas reduction goals for the concrete mixes. To reduce cement, the greenest source of embodied greenhouse gas in concrete, the materials engineer proposed mixes with supplementary cementitious materials. Once again, these are commonly called SCMs, such as ground granulated blast furnace slag. The maximum percentage of SCMs used in this project mixes was 50%. It saved 1,386 1, metric tons of CO2, so significant savings. So as I mentioned before, some of these uh, SCMs are in short supply in areas like New England and Boston, but I would suspect that Pennsylvania has a lot more available than some of these other areas. And quite frankly, quite frankly, they're just laying in the landfill, most of them anywhere anyway as waste. So um, yeah, earlier I talked about this uh, industry-wide EPD for ready mix concrete. Good to have, you can look up your region or your state and you can find what the average is for embodied carbon is in your region. As we talked about before also, there are many, usually many different types of concrete PSIs in, in a building. The higher strength PSIs usually have a larger carbon footprint. Um, so we talked about the carbon budget. It's better to have it for the entire building as opposed to each one of these different items. So the industry-wide averages uh, can be downloaded. I'll give you the, the code for this on the next slide, but it's, this is an example of what it shows for different, the region averages for different PSIs in your area and what those averages are if you use slag or fly ash and et cetera. This is where you can get this document. I suggest you uh, get this because um, you're always, when you're talking to your clients and stuff, you always want to be conscious of what the regional benchmarks uh, are and uh, how you're reducing uh, from that. So this this is regional benchmarks for EPD product declarations. And this is the uh, LCAs that support those EPDs. This is also available and it's also broken down by region. And if you see, uh, here's one for the Eastern region. And uh, let me just see your, yeah, number of plants, like uh, it includes all these kind of grouping of states. So these are very good uh, benchmark data to have in your toolkit. So you can be um, fluent in what's going on in the region. So then again, you know, you do use like a impact estimator for a building and you look at different mixes, the standard mix as opposed to fly ash or slag and you, and you compare these things with, with different accounting programs such as, such as Athena. Then you do the estimates for all the different, uh, quantities and properties of concrete in the building, the math foundation, the basement walls, the columns, the shear walls, et cetera. Then you compare, you, you have the reference benchmark listed, and then you do proposed design mixes. Like here's an example, one with slag and one with fly ash. Then you run the reports. So this is, I think this is the benchmark. This is building, this is, this is with the slag, I think. And this is the other. And then you can do, uh, you know, kind of proof of stake kind of 
diagrams or, or spreadsheets on the reference mix has, has a zero uh, reduction in, in greenhouse potential, greenhouse gas potential, and the other two mixes with slag and fly ash. One with slag and one with fly ash and slag can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 36%. Uh, and the proposed specification language, you know, how you present these goals. A lot, sometimes the, these goals are kind of dictated by organizations such as the GSA, once again, which is the largest landlord. GSA, when they moved to a 20% reduction in, in the embodied carbon and concrete, it was significant because if you remember, I still remember, I'm old enough to remember, they were the, the largest landlord in the United States. They uh, kind of manage all the federal buildings. And I remember when they mandated that uh, architects used uh, uh, BIM, you know, BIM models for all their drawings, that changed the industries. Everyone just moved from AutoCAD to Revit or some other kind of BIM system, and that changed really fast. So right now they're mandating this these uh, carbon reductions. So option one is to supply concrete mixes such that the total global warming potential of all concrete in the project is less or equal to a specific tonnage of CO2 equivalents as calculated using the Athena impact estimator for building software. Option two would be to another way of doing the same thing is to supply concrete mixtures such as the global warming potential of all concrete in the project that's 30% or more below the GWP of a reference building using the benchmark mixes is established by NRMCA and available for download at nrmca.org. Su submit a summary report of all the concrete mixtures, their quantities and their GWP to demonstrate what that the total GWP of the building is 30% or more below the GWP of the reference building. Contractor may use the Athena impact estimator Blah, 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 for different design mixes. Here's another case study I'm going to speed up because here's another case study, 20% reduction. You know, all these different, here's like uh, the carbon leadership form reduced their 2023 uh, North American material baselines. You know, there's concrete in this report. And actually this report is takes our, the concrete data from the NRMCA data. So this is another important thing to have in the toolkit and the alignment of all these benchmark benchmark baselines is very important in our, in our industry. Here's a curb, there is a CLF video on uh, kind of the big problem with cement and concrete. Once again, I think like a uh, cement, there's only like, you know, plus or minus, like there's like a hundred or so cement manufacturers in the U.S. So if we can come up with a solution in this industry on significantly lowering the carbon footprint of cement, I think it could be easily scalable because it's not that complicated of a thing. And it's much more easier to do it in this industry than like the steel industry, which is much more complex. So I think it's that day is coming. So all these regulations and incentives, we 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 measured that uh, we talked about the Fed under the GSA's low embodied concrete standard. Contractors are asked to provide concrete that reflects a twenty percent reduction in the amount amount of G greenhouse gas emissions. There were other bills like the New Jersey bill and the New York bill, which were uh, New York, New Jersey first, and then New York next. They're giving like uh, tax credits to concrete manufacturers. These were important uh, bills and everyone's like, I know in New England here, I, I sit with like uh, Mass. Mass is saying we're falling behind. Look what New York and New Jersey is doing. Connecticut saying the same thing. So there, those two states are working on very similar pieces of legislation and so is PA. Actually, I personally got pulled into the, uh, the, the Low Embodied Carbon Concrete Leadership Act Coalition, which, which I just had a meeting this week. They're modeling their bill for Pennsylvania off of the New Jersey bill and hoping to get tax incentives. If anybody's interested in getting on that committee, please let me know. Uh, we're at the point right now where we're, we're uh, soliciting um, legislators to be sponsors of the bill in a strategic manner. And uh, we've been working a lot with the New Jersey people who got their bill passed. And these are, these are really important, these bills, because um, I go to the NESI any the the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association meetings, 
and that's all of New England and New York. And, and every, what everyone's talking about now is the stacking of incentives with the IRA money coming, uh, with and plus some of these New Jersey, New York bills. You know, the you can get rates for up to thirty to fifty percent on back on some of these things especially for things like geothermal and stuff like that. So it's really important to understand how these incentives can be stacked. And, you know, it's really important also to understand that like the developer money is probably going to go to the states that have the best incentives that can be stacked. So it's really important to be able to, uh, there's a lot of new consultants popping up in this area, I see. And uh, I think it, it behooves you to be, uh, everyone to be knowledgeable and, and explaining this to your client, because if you don't do it, your competition probably will. Um, also, innovation in this space is just exploding. I was at Green Build in uh, San Francisco last, I can't remember when it was, last year, end of last year. And uh, everyone coming up to the booth was a lot of Stanford MBAs and venture capital people, <laughs> because People know that if you want to impact greenhouse gas emissions on the planet, concrete with its 8% footprint is the place to start. Uh, you make a, like I say, 50% reduction in that. And it, it's huge because it's not going away. And concrete is so important for resiliency and, and, and it's a universal product. So it's a relatively simple. I mean, you would think it's a simple problem to solve, but it's not so much, not so simple, but a lot of people are working on it. Uh, so the venture capital ecosystem is very rich. Uh, I worked on Wall Street for 10 years, so I kind of know this is a sign of good things to come. Since 2014, there have been 893 venture capital deal venture capital deals were done in the concrete sector alone. 65, 66 billion was invested, and the post-launch valuation of those companies currently stands at an impressive $70 billion in value. Good things are coming in this industry because a lot of people looking at it. There are many firms like SOM is, is uh, we just did a podcast with SOM. They have this new vision that they launched at COP27 in Egypt, which is uh, like a thin, like a concrete thin shell structure that, you know, their theory is, is carbon comes with all the stuff. Let's try to get minimalized and get rid of all the stuff and make a really thin shell concrete structure. They work with a company called Prometheus in, in Dallas and, um, you know, I, I, I vision a future where these things are going to start clicking and we'll start viewing uh, at some point within five to 10 years, concrete may be the solution for our problems. Another big thing we've been working a lot with, I've been specifically working with a company out of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Realize, on carbon credit tokenization. It's the process of creating digital tokens representing real carbon credits uh, with the help of blockchain technology. These credits are verified, transparent, and liquid. They can be bought, traded, and sold like any other digital asset. This will help the industry move from planting trees to tokenized forward credits. Right now, most carbon credits are associated with planting trees. But if we, these people that I've been working with, they talk about that EPD. They say that EPD with maybe an EPD show proves that you have a 30% reduction in the carbon footprint of concrete. That has a monetary value right now based on all these incentives. And if we can put that on the blockchain and use that to trade that piece of paper, it would scale and speed up things tremendously. So this is another big world if you're if you're in this world that is exploding right now, because you know there's a thing called insetting or offsetting. You know, everyone has their 2030 and 2050 carbon neutral goals and very hard to meet them, meet those goals just by insetting. So you're going to have to offset. And if we can start tokenizing and making this whole new economy with these carbon credits, it's a it's truly a paradigm shift for our industry. OK, so I think that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop the share and.